Hello, and we are at the module 35 of the Symbolic Logic course. How are you doing today? And we are about to finish this categorical logic that we started some three, four modules back. So today's module is going to be the end of that categorical logic discussion. We have looked into syllogisms in the last module, and today we said we are going to look into how to establish the validity and invalidity of the syllogisms. And we'll take a look into a brief glance into how it used to be done traditionally uh, by conventional Aristotelian logic. But that's not the route we are going to follow. So, uh, but a brief acquaintance to that, and then we move into what would be our way of testing the validity and invalidity of the syllogisms. And that is going to be the last topic for today, namely how to test the syllogisms by Venn diagrams. So we are going to bring the Venn diagrams once more and show you how you can actually demonstrate the validity or invalidity of syllogisms by the Venn diagrams. All right, so that is going to be on our agenda for today's module. See, uh, when I have told you already that you know there is a reason why uh, Aristotle is so uh, particular about the structure of the syllogisms. You saw the formal requirements. I mean that it has to be this, it has to be that, so many terms and so many places, positions, and so on. The reason is that uh, he was concerned was to distinguish between the genuine arguments and the spurious ones. In his times, sp public speakers were all around. They used to be called the rhetoricians or the orators. So people would be uh, just listening to them. But at the same time, it was felt, especially by the erudite scholars like Aristotle, that there has to be some criteria by which we can tell that the reasoning of this kind is not acceptable and the reasoning of that kind is acceptable. So, uh, in a way, what we are looking at is uh, that, that there has to be certain genuine pieces of uh, argumentation, which he would call the syllogisms, and where the conclusions would follow of necessity from the premises. And then there would be the spurious kind of arguments, where seemingly everything would be in place, and apparently there would be some convincing argument, argumentation going on, but actually logically speaking, uh, they're all worthless. So the whole point was how to separate the seemingly acceptable ones from the actually acceptable ones. So the rigid structure of the syllogism sort of gives us a clue how to have that distinction made. This is how we, we landed into uh, the fo notion of formal um, requirements for an argument. and formal validity, formal invalidity, because he is going to talk about validity of the syllogism is a matter of the form, the argument form. It has nothing to do with the subject matter. It has nothing to do with what the syllogisms are about. So this is how he went towards a syllogistic form. Now if you look at the, uh, the traditional way how they used to compute the validity of syllogisms, then you will have an idea about what I'm talking about. Uh, see, they used to the Aristotle and Aristotelians uh, used to determine syllogistic validity and invalidity in terms of two things, namely mood of the syllogism and the figure of the syllogism. Mood here does not mean the emotional state of the syllogism. Mood here would mean the type of standard form categorical propositions that the syllogism is made of. For example, take a look into this. This syllogism, all subscribers are persons who are listed, no persons who are listed are tax evaders, therefore no tax evaders are subscribers. You have an A proposition followed by E proposition, two premises, and the conclusion is E. And this is going to be the mood of the syllogism, this sequence A E E, that is the mood of the syllogism. All right? So this is what they called the mood of the syllogism, the kind of uh, categorical proposition that the syllogism is made of. 
right? Uh, has, as you can see, doesn't matter what content we are talking about. We are talking about the kind of categorical proposition that the syllogism is made of. Similarly, the figure, when we say the figure, we actually mean a shape and this shape is rather an interesting proposition here. Uh, here is another, uh, just I kept another example for you to sort of see the mood. This is the second syllogism. Some humans are creatures who have a long lifespan. All humans are mammals. Therefore, some mammals are creatures who have a long lifespan, I A I and the mood is also I A I. Let us come to figure as I was saying. The figure refers to the positions of the terms in the syllogism. Terms here would mean the major, minor and the middle term. right? Now, there can be only so many configurations of these terms within the premises, okay? not including the conclusion, but in the premises where are these major, minor and middle term located. So, accordingly they figured out that there is going to be only four possible figures. Okay, just take a look and I will show you. So, here is for example, the, the black lines here for example, this, this refers to the positioning of the major, minor and the middle term. Major is P, minor is S and the middle term is m. So, here is this inverted z. This is one kind of possibility that you can see where the terms are located in the premises. This is second possibility. So, you see this is major term, then comes middle, middle and then minor. So, you have sort of like a end bracket and this is the third figure, third possibility that you have almost like the first or the, the opening bracket. And here is the z figure that is 4. So, 4 possibilities and then they called it the first figure, the second figure, the third figure and the fourth figure. All right? Now, these are the possible positions in which the terms can be. Remember, there is also the mood. Now, if you com just combine all of this. So, you have 4 possible figures and then there are so many, there are four categorical propositions and there are so many kinds of possible permutations and combinations possible. So, there are 64 possible moods and four possible figures that gives you total 256 possible syllogistic forms. That is totality. Now, out of that how many are valid and this is where the logicians really went uh, into great details using this mood figure and distribution of the terms. They had a very different kind of scheme to come up with this kind of conclusion that only 15 out of this totality is are actually valid and they demonstrated that. So, only 15 forms. Now, as you can see this is pretty complicated. This is a very different kind of uh, approach to validity and involved, but they it was a very formal one not even once they refer to the content of the syllogisms. Now, we are not going to go this way. We are not going to use the mood and the figure and uh, distribution and so on. Our method is going to be as you know earlier also we have tried to do this is by the Venn diagram. So, what we are going to do is take three overlapping circles. Why three? Because there is going to be three separate terms in the syllogism, namely the minor, the major and the middle term. So, S, P and M, we will take and each circle would be dedicated for each of this term. Three overlapping circles within the universe of discourse. Without universe of discourse, I told you the Venn diagram does not even make any sense. Now, in this figure, what we will try to do is to only try to plot the premises. I do not know how many times I need to repeat this, but I will I'll, I'll risk that and I will say this that we shall only try to plot the premises. We are not going to plot the conclusion. Please take it down if necessary. That conclusion is not to be plotted in this diagram. Only you plot the premises in this three overlapping circles. Now, what is the idea? The idea is that 
if it is valid, you know it is a deductive argument, if it is valid the truth of the conclusion will be contained within the premises. So, if you plot the premises, if the syllogism is valid, then the same diagram will show the conclusion's truth also obviously. Okay. It is an if and only if or if the same diagram shows the conclusion's truth obviously, then the syllogism must be valid. Otherwise, it is invalid. So, once more our modus operandi is like this that we are going to do a Venn diagram um, of three overlapping circles within universe of discourse where we only try to plot the premises and not the conclusion. If by plotting the premises thereby we also show the truth of the conclusion, we know that the syllogism got to be valid. If it does not show the truth of the conclusion as you will be able to see, then syllogism is invalid. So, this is how we are going to work with the, the Venn diagram and the demonstration of the syllogistic validity or invalidity. Now, let us get acquainted with this uh, of three overlapping circle diagrams. See, this is your U D that has to be there and then in that we have drawn three overlapping circles H P M. It would be worthwhile to sit down and sort of fill this out by yourself to see which area represent what. So, as you can see this is an area within the U D which is S bar P bar M bar. So, S P M have no presence here, but it is within your purview of or the universe of discourse. This on the other hand where you have P, but you do not have any S or M. This is an area where you have M, but you do not have S or P. This is where you have S, you do not have P and M. Now, this is where you have S and P, but you do not have M. This is where you have S and M, but no P. Take a look and this is the only area, this is the only S P M area where all three are present. So, this is how we are going to read the regions and this is an example that we will try to work in, but again I suggest that you try to draw it on your own and try to demarcate the area what classes it represent. Okay, that would be a hands on exercise for you just to get acquainted with this kind of diagram. So, we take an actual example of a syllogism and we will try to represent it using the Venn diagram in a second. So, no star is a planet, no asteroid is a star. All right. So, this is where we see that this got to be the middle term huh? because it is present twice and this is your major term, this is your minor term. So, S, P and M all are marked here. Now, we go and we try to plot this together. So, here is your syllogism once more and first of all draw a rectangular box which is your U D right and then inside you put your this three overlapping circles. Now, you have a choice you can call them S P M or you can just label it like so asteroids, planets and stars. Okay. Now, what is to be done? what is to be done is that we go by the premises. We take the first premise which is the major premise, no star is a planet. Let us see, no star is a planet, which are the classes involved? The stars and the planets and this says the star planet intersection area got to be empty. So, this is your area, star planet has to be empty, we shaded it. Okay. So, in front of you maybe I can do that we will just try to shade that. So, this is what the first one says, right. The second one says no asteroid is a star, ok. So, which classes? Asteroids and stars and it says the intersection area has got to be empty or shaded, fine. So, we will do that, ok. So, now we have this. Remember we said we are not going to plot the conclusion. So, we are not plotting this, but what does it say? asteroid is a planet, no asteroid is a planet which means asteroid planet intersection got to be empty or shaded. Asteroids and planets, let us see what is the intersection area? This, is it totally shaded? No, only half of it is shaded. What does that mean? It means that even after we have 
plotted the entire premise set, there is still an area remaining unshaded. Therefore, the truth of the conclusion is not shown in the diagram. Did you see that? This says no asteroid is a planet. If it had been shown, the whole area would have been shaded out by just plotting the premises, right? But that is not shown here. Therefore, we have not really established that no asteroid is a planet, correct or not? We have not shown that. And you need to indicate which area does not show that. This is the area. There is an area of asteroid planet which is still not empty. It is not shaded means it is not empty. Therefore, this syllogism is invalid. Okay? We plotted the premises. By plotting the premises, it is expected if it is a valid syllogism, our conclusion's truth will be automatically demonstrated. That has not been done. And in fact, there is a whole lot of area that is open huh, that should have been shaded. That shows that we have not been able to establish the truth of the conclusion. Hence, the syllogism is invalid. All right? So, this is how we are going to go about it. And um, this is if you have a problem of understanding it, go slowly over what I have said and look at the picture and try to read. Now, this reading would depend upon where how good you were uh, when I explained uh, the AEIO plotting with the Venn diagram. You know? So, if you have understood that part, then this is not at all a problem. Otherwise, I suggest you go back and take a look into the AEIO Venn diagrams a little bit, because that that learning is being implemented here. So, if you are not strong there, then this is going this is where you are going to have trouble too, but I hope uh, that should be not a problem for anyone. Um, the AEIO has a very clear sort of Venn diagrammatic represents and that is what we are doing right now. So, here is the other example and we are going to tie try it together. See this says all contributors for the charity event are successful industrialists. And then minor premises, no success, the successful industrialists are lazy persons. All right? Therefore, no lazy persons are contributors for the charity event. Right? This we are going to now plot. Which ones to plot? The premises. And we are going to have a Venn diagrammatic presence with all three terms. This is your middle term, this is your major term and this is your minor term. So, you can do it, I mean just for your sake, I will try to do it in two steps, so that you see how it is being done. The first one, first of all the rectangular box, then place the circles within and call them SPM or successful industrialist. The labeling must be done. Take the first one all contributors for the charity event, which is P, all P's are M's, fine. All P are M's, which two classes? P and the M class. And remember, all P's are M's means if you go back to your A Venn diagram, then you will see all P's are M's means there is this whole P area, which is not M is empty. So, we shade this area, right. P, but not M area is empty, correct? This is what we captured. Same in the same picture, I have done it in two steps. You do not have to do it in two steps, but I am just showing you because we are beginners here, and some of you might be a little bit uh, taking time to understand this. So, here is this picture for the first premise, second premise, and the same picture you plot it. No successful industrialists are lazy persons. So, we are talking about this is your M and this is your S. So, no M or S. These two circles will have to be seen. So, no M or S according to this premise, we shade this area. M S intersection area is now shaded. Now, what is the conclusion? The conclusion says no S R P. All right. So, S and P are here. If it is true that no S R P, what will happen? the S p area will be automatically shaded. Has that happened? The answer is yes. Just by plotting the premises here, what you have done is to shade out this area. 
the S p area you have declared as empty. All right. Did you see that? So that establishes the truth of the conclusion automatically. Therefore, you have shown by plotting the premises the truth of the conclusion. Hence, what happens to the syllogism? The syllogism is valid. Get it? I think you are getting a better picture now and slowly I think you are coming to terms with it. So, this is how you establish the validity of syllogisms. More examples. See, when you have so far what we have seen is that we had all universal propositions in our premise and conclusion. Now, it may happen that in the premises you have a mixture. So, there are some universal, one of them is universal, one of them is particular. When that happens, what to do? The answer is always plot the universal first, because universal indicates there are some empty areas, okay, unpopulated areas, and the particular shows where there are people, populated areas, non empty areas. So, you want to indicate first the empty areas, so that your population does not land into an empty area. So, this is how we will go by. This is a syllogism which says all alligators are reptiles, some alligators are creatures that live in Florida's wetlands. So, some creatures that live in Florida's wetlands are reptiles. Can you recognize the middle term? The middle term is this alligators, right? And this is your this is whole thing is your minor term, this is your major term, fine. So, now we are going to show how to do this. This is the picture. Once more, reminding you to draw the universe of discourse, and all alligators are reptiles. So, this is alligators, this is reptiles. So, all alligators which are not reptiles, that class becomes empty. Can you see the shedding? If not, we will draw it like so. All right. So, this is where it goes. And then some alligators are creatures that live in Florida's wetlands. So, some alligators and creatures living in Florida's wetland that there you want some population. See this x represents that, because you cannot land the x here, which is already shaded. So, the only area that is remaining between these two circles is this area. This is where your x automatically lands. Now, the conclusion says some creatures that live in Florida's wetlands are reptiles. So, this two area, this intersection area of these two circle should have at least one person or one entity there. Is that the case? Yes. Why? Because this remember this is your SPM area, right. And this is where S and P are both present and anywhere in this area an X would show that the conclusion is valid and this is exactly how it is shown. Get me? So, this is the verdict on this syllogism that the syllogism is valid. And then let me further make this point that there may be situations uh, when you are putting the x that uh, there is not very clear. See, I mean you have so many regions in the in the Venn diagrams and you may not be sure where exactly the x would land. Uh, in this case, it was pretty clear this is where the x has to land, right. But there may be situations when you are not sure whether the x would fall here or x would fall here. Now, this is S p m area, but this is S p area, but it is not m. Get me? So, this is possible. Now, and I mean different kind of syllogism come with different kind of demand. So, it may be possible that there is some unclarity about which region the x belongs to. When that happens, you are not sure which area the x should go to, your job would be in all fairness to put the x on the border of these two regions. Once more, when you are not sure whether the x belongs to this region or that region, in all fairness I said put the x on the border of both the regions. Okay. So, for example, this is just an arbitrary uh, example of a syllogism, where it is not clear, it may not be clear from the premise, whether the x belongs here in the S p m area, or whether it belongs to this area, okay, where there are only 
two circles present, but this circle is not present. Fine. In that case, what is to do? We need to put the x on this border. This border x means the x may belong here, x may belong here. You do not know which one. Fine. As a result, syllogism may turn out to be invalid. As a result, the syllogism may still be valid. That is not the point. The point is that this is what is required forthcoming from the premise. And in that case, you need to be logically fair. All right. So, this is where we are going to close the discussion on the Venn diagram and the validity of the syllogisms. And we have seen how traditionally it used to be done. And from that, we have shown also how we are going to do tackle it by Venn diagrams. All right. So, this puts a closure on our discussion of categorical logic. From next module onwards, we are going to leave categorical logic behind. Okay. So, thank you very much for your time and your patience. We will see you again in the next module.